Welcome to another session uh, of the grammatical theory lecture. Today uh, is the second part of the government and binding um, uh, series of lectures. Um, last week we introduced several basic assumptions, uh, discussed the basic setting um the t model that maps from deep structure to surface structure and today we will look at um, how that can be applied to the analysis of certain phenomena um, throughout the uh, lecture um, i will show you how um, various theories can be applied to the same set of phenomena. So it's um, like verb position, uh, scrambling, passive, um, and so on. And um, we will start today with the first theory, government and binding. And um, yeah, because it's uh, it's the first theory we look at. We will need uh, a lot of time to introduce the basic concepts, but um, that will be much. Uh, the The discussion of the uh, other theories will be much quicker because we then already have the basic ideas in place. Okay, so today we will um, talk about the analysis of verb position and long distance dependencies in government and binding. The reading material for this uh, lecture, for this session is uh, section 3.2 and 3.3 in uh, the grammar theory textbook. And before we start talking about German, uh, we have to look at um, the, the analysis of English clauses. Um, that's sort of strange since looking at German should be sufficient, but um, it's often the case in uh, mainstream generative grammar that uh, analysis of particular languages are modeled after uh, English, right? And um, the, the reasoning, it, it's sort of a cliche, right? Stereotype. Uh, the reasoning is somehow like this. Um, one assumes that grammars are formed or limited by universal grammar. So that's our genetic uh, uh, endowment um, enabling us to learn uh, natural languages. And um, then we know that English has uh, a certain property, uh, certain analysis is uh, um, plausible for English. And um, because we somehow uh, think that all languages are uh, similar, then uh, it's inferred that uh, all languages have the property X. So the analysis works for English, Chomsky worked it out. Um, he's very smart, so it's probably also possible to extend this analysis to, to other languages. And um, in principle, this is correct, but the question is how much of this English specific um, stuff is taken over to other languages and it may not work or it may not be the best analysis and even in terms of language acquisition, uh, not the most plausible one. Okay, so be careful with this kind of uh, reasoning. Um, but um, what I want to show you today is an analysis of uh, the German clause that is very similar to what has been suggested uh, for English. Um, it's this analysis is not assumed by everyone uh, in government and binding, working in a government and binding framework or in, in minimalism. Um, but um, 
so so there are, uh, there are alternatives like the uh, uh, analysis suggested by Hubert Haider. Um, and these alternatives are also assumed in uh, alternative frameworks like uh, LFG or HPSG. But I want to um, show you one analysis that has been suggested in the government and uh, binding tradition by a leading scholar in that field, Günther Grebendorf. So um, let's have a look at this uh, particular uh, analysis. Okay, so um, this is an English clause uh, with a complementizer. Um, we uh, already discussed the IPVP structure uh, last week. So the the point was so usually it was um, the 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 rules for English where a sentence consists of an NP and a VP, right? S goes to NP VP. And then that works for, for normal sentences, but for sentences with auxiliaries, there that was sort of strange because um, then one had like uh, a sentence consists of an NP, an auxiliary, and a VP. That was not really expert theory. And so Chomsky suggested that one has an I hat uh, for the auxiliary, and then one has I bar and IP. And um, by assuming this, you have the uniform structure for all uh, major phrases. And um, this can, of course, be extended to the C domain, uh, C for the complementizer. So we have the complementizer in C0, then C bar and CP. And this is the IPVP stuff that we already saw last time. Okay, so um, if you, what we saw so far were uh, normal sentences with uh, an auxiliary, the question is how are yes no questions formed? Um, the assumption is that an auxiliary is fronted and that um, so it's moved to the left of uh, the subject. And uh, the position into which this auxiliary is moved is the C position. So in, in the uh, lexical head of uh, the, the CP. Um, yeah, and, and WH questions can be formed by additionally preposing an element. So it uh, 83 show, shows an example where the object of read is fronted. So Anne will read something and then here this something is uh, fronted and realized as a WH element. This shows that uh, analysis uh, uh, and, and, uh, or gives a tree structure for the analysis. Um, here again our IP and the auxiliary that uh, is here, the, the lexical head of the IP is moved to the C position and um, we have a CP with the um, auxiliary in initial position. So the, the next thing we want to look at is the formation of WH phrases, uh, WH uh, questions. Um, so then um, uh, one of the constituents of the clause is uh, questioned and is moved in front of the uh, auxiliary in C. So we get something like this, what will N read? So the I is moved to the specifier position of uh, CP. Okay, before we can start and uh, apply that technology or that analysis to German, we have to talk about some um, basic terminology. Um, that's a topological field model of, of the German clause. And um, those of you who read the book, uh, uh, the first chapter of the grammar theory textbook already uh, read about this terminology. So it's in this first part of the book, the first chapter, because it's relevant to all the 
theories we, we look at. It's descriptive terminology, basically. Um, but uh, I postponed it uh, in, in the slides till here since uh, we need it right now and it's good to introduce it now. Okay, so um, the, the terminology goes back to Drach uh, in the 30s. Uh, that was the first publication dealing with topological fields. The fields Drach used were a little bit uh, different. Uh, from what is used today and uh, the, the terminology that is used today uh, goes basically back to Reis and Höhle um, and uh, Marga Reis is, uh, was professor in uh, Tübingen and uh, Tilman Höhle was her assistant. Um, he really published a, a lot of uh, very good, well, both of them, um, very good uh, papers in German linguistics. And um, the, uh, Höhle had a, like a book type manuscript on topological fields um, that uh, was first published in, in uh, 2018. Um, it was like a draft uh, from, from the 80s that was circulated and it was first published in a volume that uh, basically republished all his papers and also uh, previously unpublished work. Okay, um, the, the terminology that was introduced by Marga Reis and Tim Anhöhle uh, is Vorfeld, uh, linke Satzklammer, rechte Satzklammer, Mittelfeld und Nachfeld. So Pre-Field, Left and Right Sentence Bracket, uh, Middle Field and uh, Post Field. There are additional fields um, uh, suggested by Gunnar Beck uh, in the 50s. Um, it's, it's a very good book. If you read German, you should uh, uh, read this. Um, as well. Um, so he introduced further fields for talking about verbal complexes, but that's not uh, important for the uh, things we are dealing with in this course, so we don't introduce this terminology. Okay, so um, We, we start talking about these topological fields by looking at the positions of the verbs. So in uh, 84, the finite verb is highlighted. Uh, it's in final position. Peter had erzählt, dass er das Eis gegessen hat. So this uh, is a finite verb and it's in the final position. Um, we can form uh, uh, a question by just taking that uh, finite verb and putting it into the initial position. Hat Peter das Eis gegessen? We can form uh, verb second sentences, like uh, declarative main clauses. Peter hat das Eis gegessen. So here it's in second position. Um, the interesting thing is that only in that example, the, non, the, the, the verbs are adjacent to each other. Uh, in all the other examples, we have the uh, the finite verb separated from the non-finite verbs and in a position to the left. It's uh, the, these um, positions where the verb, uh, the finite verb, can uh, be placed are uh, called left sentence bracket and uh, the. Uh, position to the right where the non-finite verbs and maybe the finite verb goes uh, are called right sentence bracket. The complementizer or conjunctions go to the left sentence bracket. Um, yeah, so while does op um, go to the left sentence bracket. Um, the Höhle also published a paper in, in 79 uh, with a title, Complementizer and Finite Verb um, Form a Natural Class. And he, he really compared these two items 
and um, say, okay, they, they behave uh, rather similar in various ways. So in German, they have uh, complementary distribution. So if this uh, thing is not um, present here, the finite verb can go to this position. So I introduced the terminology left and right sentence bracket. And uh, if we have this bracket as, uh, as, a, as positions in, in the clause, we can talk about the uh, areas before that, between the brackets and uh, after the brackets. And that's uh, how forefeld, mittelfeld, and nachfeld are defined. So the area before the left sentence bracket is a forefeld, the area between the brackets is a middlefeld, and the area following the right sentence bracket is a nachfeld. So this is a, a table uh, providing an overview of some of these cases. Um, due to, to space limitations, I, I cannot uh, provide glosses here, um, but you can have a look into the book uh, where the examples are glossed. So that's basically uh, the forefield, the initial field, um, with some phrase in there, some, this, it's a subject in this case, then left sentence bracket with a finite verb, a middle field, um, and right sentence bracket with um, uh, non-finite verbs here. They are all non-finite actually. And um, then there can be some material in the middle field. It can be empty as you see here. And there are extra post clauses uh, in some of the examples. There are different clause types with imperatives and so on. Um, yeah. Okay, there's one interesting thing. Also um, discovered by Gunnar Beck, it's the so-called Rangprobe. So if you look at uh, 87, you see that I assigned um, these constituents to topological fields. So that would be Vorfeld, Linke Satzklammer, Mittelfeld, Nachfeld. And the question is why is this Nachfeld? Why isn't it Mittelfeld? So there is no verb here, right? So that, that should be the right sentence bracket, but there is nothing. So how do I know that it's here, the right sentence bracket? Why isn't it here? It could be there as well, in principle. But there are reasons to assume that the right sentence bracket is here. And um, uh, the, the, the test that Gunnar Beck developed is the so-called Rangprobe. What he did is that he said, okay, let's put that into the perfect and uh, then the right sentence bracket is uh, filled, right? So then you have, der Delfin hat dem Kind den Ball gegeben, das er kennt. Hat dem Kind den Ball gegeben, das er kennt. Um, so here you see, okay, the right sentence bracket is filled. The relative clause is positioned after the right sentence bracket. Um, if you uh, try to put the, the participle to the right of this uh, relative clause, you see that the sentence is ungrammatical. So, der uh, Delfin hat dem Kind den Ball das erkennt gegeben. It's impossible, you cannot, it, it just doesn't work. It's strongly ungrammatical. So that shows us that if there is something, then it has to, uh, a verb, then it has to go here, right? It cannot go here. That, that means that this thing is uh, the Nachfeld, right? By analogy. Um, of course, you can uh, have the relative clause adjacent to dem Kind in the middle field. But then um, it's one constituent with uh, dem kind. So think again in terms of boxes, right? If you open up the box for, for the clause, you see um, the, the stuff lying around in these fields. And here you see uh, an NP and a relative clause. 
and they are in, in different positions in, in the, inside the box. If you look into this box, you see just one box for the noun phrase, including the relative clause. So it's in there. Once you take it out, you have to move it to far, far to the right. So it cannot be uh, flowing around uh, in, in the middle field. That's impossible. So it has to go to the far right. Um, yeah, what is also interesting about these uh, topological fields is that um, they can be nested. So you can take something from the right periphery of the clause and front it. Then you have it in the forefield, but it internally in the forefield, it can be complex. So if you look at 90, the Möglichkeit etwas zu verändern ist damit verschüttet für lange, lange Zeit. So here you can take the right sentence bracket, verschüttet, uh, and für lange, lange Zeit, the Nachfeld, together and front them, and then you have verschüttet für lange, lange Zeit, ist damit die Möglichkeit etwas zu verändern. Okay, so this bracketed expression here is uh, the Vorfeld, and um, it's, it's a participle yeah, here. So it's a right sentence bracket and you have something here to the right of it. So it's a Nachfeld. So you have a Vorfeld and within the Vorfeld you have a right sentence bracket and a Nachfeld. This shows you that you need structure and that, you, that it's not possible to simply say, okay, we have these, things lying around in a box and we uh, position them uh, somehow um, next to each other. Because here, if, if you wouldn't have structure and wouldn't have this stuff in one box, then the, the right sentence bracket would be to the left of the left sentence bracket. That's something you don't want, right? So, so here it's to the right where it belongs, but here it's to the left. So the trick is to say, um, this is one box and this box is to the left of the finite verb, but internally there is a right sentence bracket and uh, a nachfeld. Okay, and there is another sentence of, of this kind or another pair. We haben schon seit lang gewusst, dass du kommst. Uh, gewusst, dass du kommst, haben wir schon seit lang. Again, you have the participle here and a sentential argument that is uh, in the nachfeld. So this is an exercise, uh, some um, examples you can uh, analyze into topological fields. And yeah, uh, it's also discussed in the book. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at our sentences and how that uh, how, how these sentences could be mapped to um, the CPIP model. So this is a picture uh, taken from Peter Gallmann's lecture and uh, he says okay we have the verb and I at the end so it's different from English right English you would have the I element here but here it's in the right periphery um, the verb takes its arguments in the VP that uh, the arguments belong to the middle field. And then you have the subject of uh, the verb that is the IP and it's um, also in the middle field. The C position is a left sentence bracket. And then there's the specifier of C that's the forefield, the prefield. Okay. Um, yeah, German is uh, regarded an SOV language. So the heads of VP and IP are serialized to the right of their argument. And um, V and I uh, form the right sentence bracket. All other arguments and adjuncts are serialized to the left of them and form the middle field. And, um, yeah, German is uh, 
pretty boring language because most of the languages are uh, SOV languages. So 40% um, languages like German, Japanese, Korean are SOV languages, uh, Persian also, and um, uh, languages like English, French, and uh, the Scandinavian languages are SVO languages. Welsh, Arabic, and so on are verb, sub subject, object uh, languages. So in principle, there are six patterns that are possible for, for the languages of the world. Um, some are very rare or maybe even non-existent, um, but German is boring uh, as far as this, uh, 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 classification is concerned, uh, so a lot of languages are SOV languages, um, but German is very exciting in the sense that it has another property, it's also a verb second language, uh, and that is really rare among the languages of the world. It's mainly the Germanic languages and uh, very few other languages. The, the general categorization of uh, languages as SOV or SVO and so on is not that straightforward. It's not just about counting uh, as for instance, the World, World Atlas of Language Structures uh, is doing. Um, so, so they count and check which pattern um, appears most often and German and Dutch are problematic for this counting business because um, uh, these are verb second languages, right? And um, so this verb second, we, we will talk about that in a minute, and this verb second property basically destroys um, the, the SOV or SVO patterns. So you uh, cannot really do the counting. You have to take a closer look and um, then decide whether you think it's SOV or SVO. Okay, so we assume that it's SOV, and I will give you some uh, evidence for that in a minute. Um, a nice result of assuming that it's SOV is that um, the closer a constituent is related to the verb, the closer it is to the right sentence bracket, and that is uh, great if we talk about uh, idioms, because um, in idioms, uh, items that belong together, uh, usually belong to the idiom, usually want to be realized together. So idioms really don't like it if they are torn apart. Um, and you get that for free if you assume an SOV uh, basic order. And what you always can or almost always can do with idioms is that, um, well, I think you can do it always with idioms, but there are other parts where you can't do it. And there are other phenomena where you can't do it. We will talk about that in a minute. So you can always take the finite verb out of the idiom and front it. And you need to do that because that's a uh, uh, um, uh, device in German uh, to change the clause type. So if you want to form a question, you have to uh, front the finite verb, otherwise you can't. Well not not the normal, you cannot form the normal kind of questions. Okay, so what is the evidence uh, of uh, 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 underlying SOV order? Um, the Most of the uh, crucial data goes back to Manfred Bierwisch. Manfred Bierwisch was uh, the first German working in transformational grammar. So he was uh, way ahead of uh, other Germans uh, who did other stuff in the 60s. Uh, well, actually he started in the 50s. And he uh, worked here in Berlin uh, for a long time. So he was, uh, uh, he still is affiliated with the Humboldt University. And uh, before that he was working at the Academy of Science of the GDR. And um, yeah, he, he was the, the 
first German and uh, East German uh, working on this, kind, this type of theories. And he argued that, uh, for example, particle verbs constitute evidence for um, a transformational analysis uh, that starts out with verb final sentences and uh, derives verb initial sentences uh, from verb final sentences. So he noticed that uh, if you have particle verbs like anfang, which mean to start, um, then the verb is only together in a verb final uh, sentence. And if you want to form a uh, declarative clause or a question, you take the verbal part of the particle verb and front this. So you tear it apart, basically. And the, the Anfang is an interesting uh, verb because it's non-transparent, so it doesn't have anything to do with, uh, with Fang. So in comparison, Loslachen yeah, is, means to start to laugh, uh, has something to do with Lachen. So you have the particle Los and the, uh, the verbal part Lachen, but uh, Anfang is different, so it's not that you have some an with the semantics and some fang. Fang in isolation means catch, um, but uh, anfang means to start, to begin. Okay, so an analysis that says, okay, this is a verb, and then part of the verb moves to initial to the initial position, um, basically gets the facts right. There are certain sentences where you have uh, an SOV uh, pattern, uh, and this is the only uh, the only structure possible, the only way you can realize or use the verb. Uh, the example is again uh, due to Tilman Höhle. And uh, it involves something that is called uh, back formation. Weil sie das Stück heute Uhr aufführen. Uh, there you have an SOV sentence, but you cannot form sie Uhr aufführten das Stück uh, gestern oder sie Uhr aufführen heute das Stück or sie führen heute das Stück Uhr auf. So these are really bad, B and C. And, um, the the reason is probably this uh, back formation um, history of the verb because um, what is back formation so it's um, basically uh, a mis misconceptualization of of a, uh, of a verb uh, or of a derivational morphology, de morphological derivation. So people see that uh, the the noun Uraufführung and think, okay, it's it ends with an um, so it's a nominalization. So it's probably a nominalization of Uraufführen. So and the problem is that Uraufführen Uraufführung is not a nominalization of Uraufführen. Uh, but it's a nominalization of aufführen. So we have the verb aufführen, then the um nominalization is aufführung, and then there is a ur prefixation. So the like the first uh, uh, performance of a theater play. So the ur is uh, the the like a prefix meaning first one, and um, then people assume wrongly that it's derived from the verb uraufführen. And this uh, strange uh, back-formed uh, verb cannot be split, or a lot, lot of these verbs cannot be split. Some, some can, so there's some variation. But I think the reason that this uh, is not so easy to split is that people say, okay, I, I somehow want that to be transparent so that I can go back to, to the history of this. And it only works if the things are adjacent. If you tear it apart, then um, people don't get that, that it's coming that way. Okay, then um, another piece of evidence for the SOV order is if you look at uh, embedded 
clauses, you see that the uh, verb is at the end. Um, if you look at non-finite clauses, the verbs are always at the end, uh, and it's only the finite verb that is uh, positioned in initial uh, position, right? So here we have an uh, embedded clause with a finite verb. Um, also, if there is a complementizer, the finite verb has to go to the end. Uh, uh, some um, some uh, one set of phenomena where you really see a difference between OV and VO languages uh, is uh, if you if you look at uh, nested embeddings uh, in German and compare that to uh, uh, Danish or uh, English, you see that in German, uh, the embedding verb is realized to the right of the embedded verb. So if you have a sentence like das er ihn sah um, and turn that into perfect, you get das er ihn gesehen hat. And if you add a modal here, then you get das er ihn gesehen haben muss. And the highest verb is to the right, so that has an index one, haben, zwei, uh, two, uh, gesehen, three, right? And if you do that in, in Danish or in English, then you get that he must have seen him. So the highest verb uh, first, then the embedded verb, and then the verb that this one embeds. And the object follows this. Uh, uh, main verb, and here the object precedes the main verb. I think that that is a pretty clear difference between the languages. And the the only thing that um, sort of breaks this uh, is uh, the finite verb. So so this stuff stays the way it is here, but the finite verb may be fronted in German. Right. So, and this breaks the counting if you want to say, uh, if you want to count which pattern is more frequent and so on, then you uh, get into trouble because of the fronting of the finite verb. An interesting thing is uh, scope. So, the scope of adjuncts. Um, Netter has uh, the two examples in, in 96. Uh, dass er absichtlich nicht lacht und dass er nicht absichtlich lacht. So they, they have different meanings, the two examples. And um, they, the meanings um, correspond to what you see here with the brackets, right? So uh, to, to get these different meanings, it may be helpful to think about two situations. Um, the first situation is that there is a comedian that has a new show and um, is sort of insecure, unsure whether it's good or not, and he um, uh, starts his show. And there is another comedian who doesn't like the first one, and um, he wants to annoy the, the first comedian uh, as a show, and goes there and sits in the very first row, and even though this new show is absolutely brilliant and funny, uh, he doesn't laugh. So just to be mean to his colleague. Uh, so intentionally, he does not laugh. And the, the other uh, uh, situation for the B example uh, would be a, a fun reel where uh, somebody died and then people give speeches and um, one of the people in the audience uh, has to think about a situation with the person who died uh, where the person was making fun or telling jokes or whatever and he has to laugh but of course that's uh, um, highly inappropriate uh, in, uh, in such an occasion and uh, it's not intentionally. So it's not the case that he intentionally laughs. So there are two 
different meanings and they uh, uh, correspond to the way uh, the sentences are bracketed. And the interesting thing is that this meaning doesn't change when you uh, have the verb in initial position. And uh, the one easy explanation is that the meaning of this sentence uh, basically um, corresponds to a sentence where the verb is here. So the verb is moved from here to here, it leaves a trace, and the meaning is computed compositionally exactly in the same way as it is uh, here, right? And the same is true for the second um, example with the verb in initial position. Um, if you would assume would not assume this movement, but would assume that this Lachen is combined with a Nicht, and then this is combined with a Absichtlich, then you would expect that this sentence, the B sentence, has the same meaning as the A sentence, but it does not, right? So that's um, an argument for, um, for this verb final basic uh, position approach. Okay, so let's look at um, the analysis of German clauses again. We start with um, verb final sentences. Um, the C position is filled by the um, complementizer, by the conjunction. And then here we have um, VP and IP. Um, and the verb moves, the, so we have a verb stem in the verb position, it moves to the I position where we have inflectional affixes. And that's basically the analysis of uh, embedded clauses, nothing else has to move. This is the picture, right? Does jeder diese Frau kennt? So here we have the verbal stem and it moves to uh, the I position. Um, the the complementizer does takes an IP as an argument. Uh, they Together they form a C bar and there is nothing in the specifier of CP. Um, when we look at verb first and verb second, uh, clauses, we, the, it's more complicated. The verb has to move further. So first um, we have, does jeder diese Frau kennt? So we have the verb stem and the, uh, the affix. And then the um, verb stem moves to the affix. And then these two together move uh, to the C position. Um, kennt jeder diese Frau, right? Uh, this is the picture again. Uh, kennt jeder diese Frau? So diese Frau kennt. The ver verb stem moves to the uh, inflection affix and the, the two of them together move uh, to the C position. Now, if we look at verb second sentences, they are assumed to be derived from verb first sentences, like the one in 100. Gibt der Mann dem Kind jetzt den Mantel? So from this sentence, uh, we can derive uh, four other sentences um, because all of the arguments can be fronted and the adjunct as well. So der Mann gibt dem Kind jetzt den Mantel is the first one with the uh, nominative in the Vorfeld. Dem Kind gibt der Mann jetzt den Mantel, the dative in the Vorfeld. Den Mantel gibt der Mann jetzt mit dem Kind jetzt. Um, uh, accusative fronted. And jetzt gibt der Mann dem Kind den Mantel with a uh, adverb fronted. So this is one example. Um, uh, of, of a, a sentence, a clause with a, a filled Vorfeld. Diese Frau kennt jeder. Again, the verbal stem moves to I. The 
complete verb moves to uh, C and um, the object here moves to uh, the forfeit. Yeah, so um, the question is what, what, why are things put in the forefield? What triggers this uh, movement? In general, this has to do with information structure. Um, uh, material connected to previously mentioned or otherwise unknown uh, information is uh, placed further to the left and um, new information, uh, so known information is placed to the left and new information tends to occur to the right. Um, so because of that, people uh, often call that topicalization, but it's also possible to have focused information in the uh, forefield. Um, and you can also have expletive pronouns there. Um, that are not referring to anything, so they cannot be the topic or focus, right? So they just uh, um, other arguments of verbs like like rain, weather verbs, and so on, or they are placeholders, and uh, they are. It, it's not that easy the um, to to describe uh, what can be placed in the forefield. And it's uh, also true that the uh, um, forefeld besetzung placement of stuff in the forefeld uh, is different from English uh, fronting. Um, in fronting in English is much more marked than fronting in German. Um, so if you look, uh, if you read Harry Potter in English, you find things uh, like like. Um, normal sentences with uh, italics, right? And this is, um, in, in some, sometimes this corresponds to uh, Vorfeldbesetzung in German, fronting in German, um, because uh, more often, in, or in many cases, um, this, what we do with fronting in German uh, is done with intonation in English. So you don't front, uh, things in English that often as you know it in German. Okay, um, one more interesting thing um, about these uh, frontings in German, they are uh, non-local. So you can front things that um, start out in, in a deeply embedded uh, uh, part of the sentence. Um, an example is given here in 102. Um zwei Millionen Mark soll er versucht haben, eine Versicherung zu betrügen. So what you see here is uh, the, the uh, um zwei Millionen Mark is coming from eine Versicherung zu betrügen. Um, eine Versicherung zu betrügen is uh, in the nachfield of this uh, sentence. Ja, er soll versucht haben and, and then there is an infinitival clause that is uh, to the right of the haben here and a nachfeld. And um, from within this clause, so it depends on betrügen, um, some constituent is fronted. Um, so what is said in uh, uh, transformational theories is that uh, the movement is not done in one go but uh, the moved constituent is moved to some specifier position. And then from there, it moves in, a in further steps to higher specify specifier positions uh, until it reaches the forfeit. Okay, so this was it. Uh, the verb position and uh, non-local dependencies. Next week, we will deal with uh, passive and local reordering um, and yeah or maybe you you watch the passive video right away but um, that will be the next session thank you very much for your attention